Yes, I have a super special guest today and I'm super excited to introduce you to Greg Dickerson. He's a serial entrepreneur, real estate developer, a coach and mentor. Over past 20 years, he has bought, developed and sold over 200 million in real estate, built and renovated hundreds of custom homes and commercial buildings and started 12 different companies from the ground up. Welcome to the show, Greg. Really appreciate that. Martinez, thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you. Thank you. Listen, can you just tell the audience, the, the ones that didn't came across your name or, or, or the company or the things that you do, can you just tell them a little bit more about yourself and how did you came across real estate in the first place? Yeah, so uh, I've been in the game 23 years and, uh, you know, I started from nothing with nothing. I joined the Navy right out of high school, didn't go to college and uh, after I got out of the Navy, I did four years and, and got out of the Navy and, um, you know, worked a few jobs, restaurants and construction were the only two things that, you know, I'd ever done and that I was doing at the time. And uh, in 1997, I moved to a coastal region off the coast of North Carolina called the Outer Banks of North Carolina. That's where the Wright brothers took off. Uh, first flight originated. Okay. Um, and I started a little, I moved there to open a restaurant. Worked in a restaurant down there the first year. Didn't like it at all. It was very seasonal and very difficult, um, very short uh, season. So I decided to get into building instead. And I started a little remodeling company. And again, started with absolutely nothing from scratch. It was just me. I had some tools. I had a truck that uh, a friend of mine sold me and uh, that I was working for. And um, I went out and started doing little remodel projects, $500 here, $600 there, $200, whatever. I would do anything. So my first year in business, I did $250,000. Seven years later, I was a $30 million building company. I was one of the largest builders down there. And I started 12 other uh, companies along the way, you know, all kind of related to the construction industry, uh, you know, real estate service industry, except for uh, one business, which was a cheerleading trampoline gymnastics school that I started with a, uh, a guy who was a phenomenal coach, but terrible business guy. So even though I didn't go to college, I am, I am very self-educated. I educated myself. I poured into myself. I developed myself, uh, my leadership skills, my business skills, and my entrepreneurial skills. And I learned by doing the hard way. I didn't have any formal mentors, but I did have other people that were more successful than me that I was doing deals for and doing deals with. I was very fortunate. The area that I was in was a resort summer vacation destination. So very successful people were coming down and buying multi-million dollar beach houses and building multi-million dollar beach houses. Uh, and they were all successful where they were coming from. So, you know, I learned from them. Uh, I'm a great listener. I'm a seeker of wisdom. So, you know, I, whenever I would do business or build a house for or with those individuals, I would, I would ask them what they did and I would learn about their business and their company. So I learned a ton by working for other people while they were paying me. So uh, it was, it was, it was a really neat experience. And I started doing just some deals with some developers and and I learned how to, uh, you know, to build and develop and get into other, other things. So my general philosophy in business has been to build and scale companies that generate cash flow to invest in other assets. So that's kind of how I'm wired. Yeah. Okay. Okay. That's it. So, so basically real estate was always in your blood. I mean, you was always passionate about it because I mean, you created, you know, 11 companies beside that, beside the other company you, you mentioned, you know, so. I mean, so, yeah. so what, 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 what about the real estate that, that you're passionate about? You mentioned, you know, the cash flow. And so like, what's the, so main the real estate, uh, you know, the real estate side is interesting. So I'm a developer, you know, more than anything else. So I like to build, you know, lease up and then sell, um, yeah. or build and sell that that's kind of what I do. I don't like to hold long term, and that's just me. I'm not saying that's the right strategy, uh, for anybody. I'm just saying me personally, I, I, I like to build and sell. I like to get in and get out. It's what I've done my whole career. It's what works for me. So that's just where, how I'm wired and how, where I come from. And, you know, the development game oftentimes is bigger dollars, you know. Um, you know, the other angle is, is great, too. There's some very successful people that in long-term wealth, you know, is built through holding assets. And as I get older, I'm looking more towards, you know, holding more assets. But, you know, I'm only 51, so my career so far has been all development. But the way I got started, uh, you know, it's really funny. I didn't even know you could do real estate investing as a business. You know, I just, again, I, you know, I just didn't know. Um, I'd owned three houses when I had moved to the beach and started my first company. And as I started doing deals for people, I started learning about real estate investing and what these people were doing. And then I had a friend of mine who was a realtor that, uh, that found a, that knew of a lot that was for sale. And he came to me and said, Hey, we can buy this lot 
And then I know somebody who wants to buy it for, you know, whatever it was, 50,000 more than we we're paying for it. You know, all we got to do is buy it and we can resell it to them. And I'm like, can we do that? And he said, sure. You know, so I was like, okay, that was a retail flip wholesale. You know, they call it wholetailing. So he said, look, put up the money. I'll do everything else. He was a realtor. I was like, okay, no problem. So I put up the money, he did everything and we split, you know, I don't know, we made 20, 30 grand a piece, 15 grand a piece, whatever it was uh, in 30 days. And I was like, man, that's easy. So that's when the light bulb started going off about, you know, doing real estate investing and, and flipping properties. And uh, then I ended up getting my real estate license and doing a little bit of real estate uh, along the way. I had a real estate brokerage under my construction arm as well. So it was real estate and construction were the two things that I did. And uh, then I just started building spec houses and uh, started flipping some houses. Then I started developing some properties, buying buildings, tearing them down, redeveloping, built some commercial buildings, did some residential subdivisions and everything just kind of, it just kind of scaled from there. So, you know, just baby steps, you know, and it sounds like a lot. It sounds like it's, you know, overnight, but I mean, this is 23 years yeah, and yeah. it was 10 years of working for other people, including the military prior to that 23 year career. So I didn't get there overnight. You know, I worked very hard. I mean, there were times in my life when I was young, when I worked seven days a week, 16 hours a day in construction, it was just me doing all the work and I'm a very hard worker. So if I was on a job and, and I knew I could finish it by 10 o'clock tonight, instead of coming back the next day, I would stay and finish it at 10 o'clock at night. And, uh, you know, I was doing some government contracting before I moved to the outer banks and I was traveling up and down the East coast and I'd be out of town. So, you know, instead of staying, you know, uh, late, I would just, you know, or instead of getting up and finishing and then going home late, I would just stay late at night till 10, 11, 12 o'clock, whatever it took, finish the job. That way I could leave in the morning and go home. So, you know, that's just, that's just, you know, how I did it and how I started and, and it's kind of how I'm working. Yeah, I, I love it. I love the, the, you know, the story that you just gave us. And thanks, thanks for sharing that, you know, because I think what well, one thing that I took out for, from your story, what you just said, you know, because again, you, you're in 50s, right? And, and like the, the people who are watching this interview, maybe a little bit younger, or maybe your age, I think the audience it could be a little bit younger. But like, the one thing is like work, work ethic, right? Yeah. Like it's, it's one piece that is sometimes missing now, nowadays, because everybody is just looking for a quick fix, you know, for, for a new software, for something, you know, an app, something that will solve a problem, you know, instantly. But now it's, you know, it's still the same. I mean, if you just have a tremendous work ethic and just keep like, you know, diving in and, and doing like exactly what, what Greg did. I mean, it's simple as that, you know, like the software or whatever new app is not going to solve all your, all your problems, especially in real estate. Sometimes you just need to dig in and just keep working. So can you just tell people from, uh, you know, from your coaching experience, uh, would you give an advice for somebody who's starting? Uh, what is the right strategy for now in a given market? You know, it depends on the individual. It depends on their financial yeah. position, what their, you know, career is, what their understanding of real estate is, you know, all those things. So, you know, if you're going to be a flipper, you know, if you're going to flip properties, you know, it, it all begins with education. And like you said, you know, work ethic, sense of urgency, you know, the best time to do anything is right now. I have zero backlog in my life. I take care of everything as it comes in, whether it's email, mail, phone call, whatever it is, I take care of it right now. And I don't procrastinate. I don't shelve anything. I don't put anything on my to-do list. I knock everything out. So when I go to bed at night, my calendar is clear. You know, my to-do list is clear. You know, obviously there are some things that you got to move to the next day, but the bottom line is whatever that task is for the day, I've got it taken care of. And I'm, I have zero backlog. So I have no stress. I'm very efficient and organized when it comes to those things and, and, you know, very strong sense of urgency. So what I would tell people is understand to be successful in business, you've got to have those things. You've got to work hard. You've got to be diligent. You have to have a work ethic. You have to, you know, have a sense of urgency, uh, figure out how you're wired and what it is that you're drawn to, you know, whether it's like me building and developing, getting in and getting out. If you want long-term passive income, then, you know, study those strategies and learn, learn about how to manage properties and how to manage property managers learn how to finance. The key is in the financing. The key is in the money. So if you're going to build a portfolio of investment properties, you need capital to purchase those properties. So you need to know how to raise money and you need to know how to find the money. Uh, and you know, that's really the key to the deal, right? The money is the key to the deal. The money has the loudest voice. So if you can raise capital and control the capital, then you can, you can get a, a nice stake in deals that you don't even have to do anything with. You can just come in and be a capital partner and, uh, and, and get involved some, in some really good deals. Maybe you're good at finding deals. So a good way to get started is to, is to go out and find opportunities to bring them to somebody else who has the money. 
Uh, so that's another way to get started. But it really begins with education. You really have to understand real estate, all the different uh, uh, types of real estate, the different classes of assets, uh, the different strategies in real estate, and just find what appeals to you. Maybe it's office buildings, it could be retail, it, it could be multifamily, it could be industrial. I mean, there's a lot of people that will specialize in a niche. And then there's people like me that do all the asset classes. And really what it boils down to is if you're going to be narrow and focused in your type of asset and the class of asset, then you have to be wide in your geography, right? So, you, you know, if you want to focus on nothing but apartments and 200 to 500 unit apartments, you're going to have to expand your geography in that search. But if you are narrow in your geography, in other words, if you don't want to travel and you don't want to go across the country and outside of the country, you know, depending on where you're located, um, then you have to pick, uh, then you have to be diversified in your asset base. So that was me. I was geographically limited. I didn't want to be away from my family and travel. You know, I, wanted to, I was coaching every sport for my kids and we were in a small community. So I was diverse in my asset class and base. So that's why I've done so many different things and so many different asset classes uh, and, and types of assets is because, you know, I was geographically limited and still am, you know, uh, pretty much to the Southeast region. So I do all sectors and I enjoy all of the different asset classes and, and there's great opportunities in all of them. So that's kind of what I would tell people. Become an expert, educate yourself, learn everything you can, find somebody who's successful doing what you want to do, learn from them by either, you can either hire them, uh, there's people like me that do coaching and mentoring, you can go to work for people, you know, if they're in your area and they're doing what you want to do, offer to go to work for them, even if you got to work for free, if you can, just say, look, I want to learn the business, I'll do anything you need me to do, I'll run paperwork, you know, I'll shadow you, whatever. Is there anything I can do? I want to learn the business. Um, so depending on the type of company and your education and your background, you know, you might be able to find that kind of opportunity. And then there's the investment side. You know, if you've got money and you, you want to get involved and you want to be a passive investor, you can invest in other people's deals. So that's really the three ways that you can get involved in real estate. Okay. Yeah, I love it. I love it that you covered almost all, all the bases, you know. If, if Greg, if Greg uh, missed something, please leave a comment down below, you know, with your question for Greg. I think he would be happy to jump in and answer your question. But I, I, I love the perspective that you just, you know, gave, like, that it's important to determine what you actually want because there is a lot of going on now in the social media where it's like, you know, like multifamily is popular or something. You know, there are some popular things that people do and people follow. Like instead of that, what you just said, just follow your own instincts, like and determine what you want. Like you wanted to get close to your family, you what you didn't want to leave, and for that you knew you need to cover all the assets, you know, different assets for for you to do that. So you you know you you find you find a way, it, 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 you know, it, in that in that place, and I love it. So yeah, and by the way, business can be passive income as well. So I bought yep. businesses, developed businesses, you know, so I invested in those as well. So. You know, businesses can be great passive cash flows, just like a real estate asset. So, you know, that may appeal to people as well. Yeah, exactly. So can you just, uh, you know, tell somebody who is who's starting now how they can start to acquire deals and what are the most important things that they need to know in, in the beginning? So, uh, again, you need to know the different types of real estate, the different classes of the assets. Um, so, for instance, types of real estate, there's six types. So you have office, uh, you have retail, you have uh, industrial, you have multifamily, you have land, and you have hospitality. Those are your six types of real estate, um, commercial real estate. And then within those, um, you have different asset classes. You know, so you got A, B, C, D, right? So A is your newer product. You know, B is your, you know, a little bit older product. Um, C is, you know, obviously it goes down the scale, right? And, you know, uh, condition of property, area surrounding, and age built is what all those asset classes are all about. And uh, so you gotta look into that. And um, you know, they're about a 10 to 15 year gap between all of those asset classes, but a lot of it is the area as well. So you need to understand that. You need to understand cash, uh, you know, financing uh, and understand how cash flow works, how the financing of real estate works, how to raise money, things like that. You gotta understand how to find deals. Um, so what I always tell everybody is start local. Real estate is hyper local, okay, meaning, you can have an asset on one block that's worth X um, and it might be trading at a very low cap rate, but you can turn the corner and go right down the street and you can't give it away no matter what the cap rate is, right? So real estate is very hyper, hyper local, you know, in terms of demand. So you need to really understand your market. When I say understand your market, you know, if you're in the residential game, you need to know how many properties are on the market, 
how long they've been on the market, how many are under contract, how long they've been under contract, how many are have sold in the last six months to a year to two years, how long were they on the market, what did they sell list price to ask price. Same thing in commercial and multifamily. You need to know what is the vacancy rate, uh, what are the going rents, what are the asking rents, you know, what, what are the vacancies, what are the different types of assets, what are the cap rates on them, what's the demand drivers that are going to send traffic to that apartment building or to that commercial building, uh, you know, things like that. What do the demographics look like? Uh, who lives around these things? Who's going to be frequenting these buildings? Who's going to be your customers and your client base? Who's going to be your tenants? You know, things like that. So you need to know those things. But to physically get started in the game, uh, you have to bring, you got to do something. So you either have to find a deal or you have to be able to find, you know, uh, raise money to invest in a deal or have money to invest in a deal. And then you can partner with people that are doing deals. Um, so, you know, that's really how you get started. And what it boils down to is if you're going to, uh, if you're going to want to secure a deal and find a deal, you have to analyze a lot of properties. You have to make a lot of offers. That's where a lot of people go wrong is they'll analyze stuff, but they never actually make an offer because they figure, ah, well, this thing just doesn't work. Well, if you're going to go through the trouble of analyzing it, it doesn't cost you anything to throw a, an offer out there, uh, or, you know, to, for something, right? So if you're, if you're taking time to analyze a deal, go ahead and put together, if it's commercial, what's called an LOI, a letter of intent, and just put down where it needs to be to meet your return requirements and just send it out and start that process. You know, start making offers, get used to it. If it's residential, same thing. You run the numbers, whether it's a rental, um, you know, you can determine working it backwards based on the income and your return requirements, how much you can pay. Same thing if you're going to flip it, you know what your after repair value is minus your repair costs, uh, determines, you know, what you can pay, you know, after your profit margin is, is taken out and expenses. Uh, so you just really need to analyze and start making offers. And that's really where a lot of people go wrong is they, they get stuck in the analysts, you know, analysis stage and they never actually make offers. And you, in this day and age, depending on the market you're in, you have to make a lot of offers to get a deal. So you got to yeah. get in the habit of just making offers. They can be verbal. They can be written. They're non-binding. You know, not gonna, it doesn't cost you anything. You're not going to lose any money to make an offer. Yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah, totally makes sense. So, you know, so what you said, basically, the, the, the market, picking, picking the, your, your market is more important than picking the deal. Because first of all, you have to start with your market. You have to determine, you, you know, what's your market criteria? Where do you want to invest? Right. And and the second thing is about, you know, should people like upfront start to negotiate, you know, if they, as you said, you know, they're going to analyze the deal and they're going to find out it's not the best deal, you know, that fits their criteria. Should they negotiate upfront, you know, with, with the owner or when it comes to the price or, or, or that goes after the due diligence and all that? I mean, what's, you know, because you mentioned sending the LOI, you know, if, if, if the deal still don't make sense, but just sending, you know, for, for the sake of, you know, maybe you're going to get the deal. Well, yeah. So when you're analyzing a deal, a deal, you know, you, you have all the financial due diligence, you know, and you have at least, you know, somewhat inspected the property. Okay. So without an agreement in place, they're not going to let you physically walk every unit. Yeah. You know, uh, some properties you can, some, some won't, uh, usually they want to wait multifamily. A lot of times they want you to be under contract before they'll let you inspect the units. Uh, but some properties, they'll let you go inspect units, depending on what it is, commercial assets, you can go walk the property and see it, houses, you can walk the property and see it before you make an offer. But usually you're going to have all of the financial information, uh, the, all that due diligence to be able to formulate your assumptions of the, the, the cash flows and the financials of the property to see if it makes sense. And, you know, let's say your parameters are you need an eight cap for something to make sense and you get all of the information in and they're, what it boils down to is they're asking a six. Well, if you need it to be an eight, just make an offer. Say, hey, look, you know, here's where I need to be. This is what I can do. Uh, these, these are my parameters. And you just make an offer. It's contingent upon, you know, all the inspections and all the criteria and everything meeting. So, um, you know, now that being said, that, that's, that's on assets that are out there and have been for sale for a while. Okay. If you've got competitive assets and there's multiple bids, multiple offers within, well, there's no point in wasting anybody's time and making an offer. So I will qualify that by saying you want to make offers on stuff that, that is for sale and has been for sale for a while, a while. And there's currently not a bunch of, you know, offers on the table. If it's okay. a competitive product and you're going to compete, then you can make a competitive offer. But yeah. you know, uh, in terms of making offers that are within your return parameters, you want to make sure it's something that, that hasn't sold yet and has been for sale for a while. But that, that means that means people should be going to be going to the C or D type of properties and probably the same locations. 
Well, you know, not necessarily. I mean, you know, there there's deals at every level. Okay. So, it, it, you know, and some markets are hotter than others. So to just, you know, and there's a lot of competition period, but there's yeah. always deals. But so the better assets right now, the bigger, better assets, there's a lot of pressure. There's a lot of competition, multiple offers, you know, you're going to be competing. So that's one level. Okay. Uh, if you're just starting out, you're going to probably have a better opportunity to be more competitive or find off market deals that aren't even listed yet. You yeah. know, or you go after the deals, like I said, that have been on the market for a while. Maybe it was overpriced, you know, um, and people are just ignoring it now. So then you go in, you analyze it, and you make an offer where you need to be. So, you know, to get started, you want to look for those things, either off market properties, you got to go directly to the seller. And, you know, I mean, literally, you got to pick up the phone or knock on the door and meet these owners of smaller properties, um, you know, and develop that relationship or go after properties that have been for sale for a while and just didn't sell because it's either overpriced or needs a lot of work or whatever it is. Generally, it boils down to the price, um, you know, or it could be a bad location. So it isn't necessarily C or D, you know, it's more of that opportunity there. It's either off market or it's been for sale and had not sold. Okay, got it. So what, what people should pay more attention because you, 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 when you mentioned analyzing a deal and, and you mentioned uh, cap rate. So is, is it the cap rate? Is it cash on cash? Is it NOI? Like what, what people should pay attention to? I mean, because, you know, there, there, is a, there, there might be a, a good cap rate, but, you know, I mean, if the deal is like eight unit deal and there's no like, there is no cash flow you have to do, you don't manage yourself and all that. I mean, what, what, when, it, when it doesn't make to make sense what when does it start to make sense you know for you to acquire a deal and to make sure that there's enough cash flow you know to cover you know the management and all that you know so yeah well that's up to the individual um you know everybody has their own return requirements so a cap rate is a cash on cash return so so those are those are basically the same thing so if a six if a property is a six cap that means if you pay cash for it you're going to earn six percent that's what that, it's a capitalization rate. So that's, an, that's, that's what you earn on your capital that you use to pay for the property. That's why I call it cap rate, capitalization rate. Uh, internal rate of return is different. That's a return calculation on the money invested down over a period of time. So if you've got a three year, five year, 10 year hold and you put $100,000 down, that's that cumulative return on that $100,000 over that you know, three, five, 10 year period. So that's what the internal rate of return is. Mm -hmm. So uh, in the world of equity, uh, so equity capital investors typically want an 18 to 24% internal rate of return over the life of the investment. So that's what most investors are looking for. Uh, uh, and then they wanna see a 10%, you know, eight to 10% cash on cash return a lot of times. Now that that's, you know, different investors. Now, institutional investors will settle for a six to eight percent sometimes, you know, and there's people that raise capital from investors and they're paying yeah. them six percent and then they're loaning it back out and making a point or two on that. Yeah. Um, you know, that's what a lot of equity funds will do. So it all depends. Now, for an individual like me, I like a 10 percent return on my cash, cash on cash minimum. I like to see 20 to 30 percent internal rate of returns. Me, you know, personally, minimum uh, is where I like to be. Uh, so you have to work it backwards. And I'll tell you right now in the United States with where interest rates are right now, if you put the standard 20 to 30% down and uh, finance the balance, you're going to need at least a six and a half to seven cap to break even. That, that's where your break even threshold is going to be. So, uh, you know, your question was where, where do you want to be, you know, for break even and all that. That's what you got to know. You got to know, uh, you know, based on your down payment and the interest rates, you do run the calculation to find out your break even. And then as the cap rate goes up, you make more cash flow and, and uh, on that, you know, uh, on that spread, right? So it all depends on how much you put down. It depends on what the interest rates are, your financing, what the term is, all those types of things. If you got a 20 year amortization, you're going to have less cash flow than a 30 year amortization. So what I just said was a six and a half to seven cap with a 30 year like agency loan at four and a half percent, that's going to break even at a six or a seven cap. If you've got a 20 year loan, you're, you know, you're not going to break even. You're going to be a little bit underwater. If you're paying interest on the, the equity portion on that down payment of six or 8% and you've got a service debt at four and a half percent to 5%, you know, that's going to be even more difficult and you need a higher cap rate in order for that to break even. So what a lot of people are doing is they're doing interest only on the balance on a value add for three to five years to lower that debt service so that it cash flows. So there's ways to get there. 
So you got to know that you always have to work the ba- work the numbers backwards. You start with the net operating income and you work it backwards from there with your financing. Okay, got it. Got it. Very specific. Thanks. Thanks for sharing for that. Yeah. So, you know, for the people again who, who are starting out, who would be, I mean, from personal, your personal standpoint, because you said uh, you, you've been working for people for free, you know, for 10, almost 10 years. And I mean, you said you didn't have mentors or, co- or coaches, you know, that much. But who were the people that you follow for, for uh, business advice or maybe some books that you would recommend for people who are starting out or, or it's not important? Yeah, well, I didn't work for people for free. So, you know, I was either building for others, you know, as a gen- I'm a general contractor builder. So I was either building for o- other investors. That's kind of how I learned. <clears throat> or I was working for people, you know, that were, uh, uh, you know, doing deals. And, and then I was, you know, partnering with some developers, things like that. So I learned by doing and I learned by, you know, being a contractor working for other people. So Um, I didn't work for anybody for free. I'm just saying if you're young and you can and you want experience, you can offer that, you know, to an individual. But I wasn't in that position. I had a family. You know, I got married young, had kids. I had to work. (laughs) Couldn't. I couldn't do it. So I learned it all that way. But uh, I read a lot of books. So the first book I read was Rich Dad, Poor Dad by Robert Kiyosaki that opened my mind to business. So a lot of people read that book and they get real estate investing out of it. When I read that book, what I got was start businesses that produce cash flow to then invest in real estate. So when I read Robert Kiyosaki's Rich Dad, Poor Dad, the first thing I did was invest in businesses. I started a business and then I you know, built everything from there and then it started investing in real estate. That's, that's what I did and that was my approach. Um, then I read uh, you know, The Power of Positive Thinking by Norman Vincent Peale, Think and Grow Rich by Napoleon Hill. Uh, they all have several you know, consistent themes. And then uh, beyond that, you know, just any number of, of like Zig Ziglar and Brian Tracy and Jim Rohn and Tony Robbins and just all of the sales, business training, professional, personal development. I mean, that's that's what I've done my entire life. Chet Holmes, great sales guy. Um, I mean, all of the old school greats, you know, and then there was the real estate guys like Russ Whitney, Carlton Sheets, you know, I studied all their programs. Um, you know, people in the real estate world, I read everything that Robert Kiyosaki put out, all his books, Dolph Del Roos was his real estate advisor. I read all of his stuff. So, uh, I constantly poured into myself and, you know, back in the day, uh, a lot of younger people don't remember, but it was, you know, it was Sony Walkman cassette recorders, you know, to, to put, you know, to listen to music while you're out exercising. So I listened to books on tape and then it became CDs. And then I had the 80 gig iPod, right? My iPod had nothing but books. I never had one song on my iPod. It was always books. Whenever I was driving around, I didn't have music playing. It was a book on tape, book on CD. Uh, And even now today, my iPhone, I have zero music. It's all podcasts. It's all uh, books on, you know, uh, you know, audio books. And, you know, that's what I do. So any downtime I have or driving time, I'm pouring into myself. And I have a strong faith as well. So I have a lot of Christian stuff and there's a lot of Christian books that I read and of course the Bible and, you know, I listen to those things as well, but I'm always developing myself constantly. I'm a lifelong learner. I'm not formally educated, but I'm very self-educated and it never stops. The older I get, the more I want to learn, the more I want to consume, the more I try to pour into myself because, you know, I do coach and mentor others and I want to be the best I can be for them. And I want them to get the benefit. So one of the things a lot of people don't think about when you read a book or listen to a course or even a podcast like this, what everybody's going to get out of me and out of a book that you're reading is everything that we know, all of the experiences that we've had, all the books that we've ever read. Um, You know, I do a lot of leadership development and training, and I've got my own philosophy of leadership that was built on a number of leadership and business books that I've read. Uh, Other books, The One Minute Manager and all the leadership systems there, Managing by Harold Janine. High, uh, high Output Management by Andrew Grove, Principles by Ray Dalio. I mean, there's all kinds of business books, Warren Buffett stuff, Sam Walton stuff. I mean, I read biographies and business books. So I take bits and pieces of all of that, and I've kind of developed and created my own system and style. So on the leadership front, you know, a lot of people, you know, study and have the mantra that you want to work on your business, not in your business, right? Mm-hmm. So I flipped that paradigm and I say, you want to work on the people in your business so that they can work on the business for you. It's all about leverage and scale and developing others. So you got to develop yourself first and foremost as a leader, uh, motivator, delegator, right? And then you develop the people on your team that are, that are with you. And I mean, everybody, your direct employees, your vendors, subcontractors, suppliers, 
uh, your partners, your asset managers, your, you know, everybody you're engaged with is your team and you want to develop them and you want to help them be better at what they're doing. So what I've always done my entire career, the way I scaled my businesses so fast and the way I scale them so fast now and what I help people do is I develop them as leaders and I help them work on the people in their business so the people work on the business for them. So that's how you scale. That's how you get to uh, the point to where you are a true entrepreneur. You're a true business owner, not uh, self-employed. Yeah. Wow. This is, you know, I'm just trying to process that. I mean, you know, at age 50, <laughs> which is still like, you know, you're, you're super young, like half of the decade just passed. But uh, I mean, at 50 years old, you start pouring in into your brain, like, like all this information, still learning to, you know, until this day, because I'm, I'm trying to think of people that I know and probably, you know, you listeners can still trying to process and think who is in this age is still pouring this much information into himself learning like doing and you know like it, it's unbelievable so truly like respect the the, the effort and, and the process that you you know that, that you're going through because there's a, a few people only i think uh, the percentage is so small you know of people who are still like learning at, at this age you know, because everybody become like oh man I know, I know everything i know like 20 25 year old people like i know everything so yeah, no, that's yeah. well, the yeah. one thing that I've been very blessed at is I've always, <clears throat> I've always known my limitations yeah. and I've always known that, you know, you just don't know what you don't know and all you know is what you know. So what I've learned in my life and my career is the more I learn, the more I know, the more I realize I don't know. Yeah. And what, what success in any area of your life, whether it's financially, spiritually, relationally, whatever that looks like for an individual and, and, and you can compartmentalize those and define success separately. There is no one definition of success that says, Oh, well, success is having a lot of friends. You're not successful. Unless you, no, you can be financially successful. You can be successful with your health. You can be successful in your relationships. You can be successful with your friends. They can all be different and compartmentalized and you can have different goals. But at the end of the day, it's all about awareness. It's all about what you know, that is the ultimate value and, you know, wisdom is being open and receptive to uh, learning, correction, and learning and knowing more. So I've been a seeker of wisdom my whole life. I start that out with every conversation when I'm talking to somebody that I want to learn from. I tell them, look, I'm a seeker of wisdom. Uh, you know, I, I want to know what I don't know. I want to know what you know. So I try to find people that are where I want to be, that are more successful than I am doing the things that I strive to do in all those different areas. It could be health. It could be whatever. It could be nutrition. Uh, it could be cooking. It could be anything you want to learn. Find people that are great at it and learn from them and be open to it and realize that it's kind of like railroad tra tracks, right? You can always go deeper. You can always go further. So if you think about standing on a set of railroad tracks and you're looking down those tracks, you know, the vision is going to stop at some point. You can walk to that point and then you can see again even further, right? Yeah. And you walk to that point, you know, you can see even further. So wisdom is the same way. You will never, ever reach the end yeah. zone of wisdom. You can always go deeper. Exactly. I love it. I love it. So I just want to follow, follow through with that, with the second question, you know, like I, I know you, you've been in the Navy, so can you just tell, you know, audience, what, 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 what was the biggest thing that you asked? U.S. Navy taught you the most in, in, in these years? You know, so I grew up with it. So um, I was groomed for it my entire life. My dad was a career military man. He went in, enlisted, came out an officer, which is very difficult. <clears throat> so I grew up with that uh, influence. You know, it's all about discipline. It's all about hard work. It's all about chain of command. You know, it's all about following orders. You know, uh, so, I mean, I grew up in a very rigid, disciplined military environment. You know, my dad was tough. And, uh, you know, it, it, it was funny. I'm not going to go into details about that, but I would say that's really it. It's really the discipline, you know, that, that you get discipline, teamwork, um, leadership, you know, uh, I'm a natural leader. My dad was a leader. So maybe I got that from him. I don't know, but I've always been a leader everywhere I go. I'm the one who's, you know, picked to be the captain or, you know, put in charge. I don't ask for it. It just happens. Or in some situations, I just do it, right? I'm just a, I'm just a leader. And, uh, and I just jump in there and I don't force it. People follow me, you know, and it's, it's just, it naturally happens. So, um, you know, so those are the things I got discipline, self, you know, self-control, uh, teamwork, leadership, 
and systems. The military, what a lot of people don't realize, the military is all about systems. And it's in every aspect of life and, you know, maintenance of the ships uh, and the offices and the buildings. And, you know, you, you know, you, ha you hear, uh, you know, strict military fashion, military discipline, um, you know, preventative maintenance systems, you know, redundancies. I mean, the military is all about systems, all about redundancies, all about, you know, uh, in, a, in a strict orderly fashion, you know, so those types of things. So that's really helped me in the efficiency of my life because I'm, I like to do a lot of things and, I, you know, um, I can get distracted, but I learn, I know how to focus and I know how to be very disciplined. So when there's something I want to do, I can lock in on it and get it done. Oh, okay. Okay. So there's, there is a good things to learn from the military. I mean, you know, for the people that, that, for the young people that never been in military and, and thinking about going there, I mean, I think this is your answer here. So how important is, is to give back people and communities? I know that you're serving on the boards of several churches, ministries, and nonprofit organizations. So because you, you, you talk about, you know, acquiring wisdom, and is it important to, at some point when you acquire that, you know, some certain amount of, where, you know, wisdom to, to give it back to the communities and, and people? Yeah, exactly. Wisdom is a gift, you know, and it's valuable. And, um, you know, there's a lot of scripture about wisdom being more valuable and precious than gold and rubies and diamonds. So, yes, you want to pass that along. You know, you want to be a giver. I'm a giver. So everybody has their different gifts. I'm a giver. So I've always been one who serves. You know, I have a, I have a gift of service and giving. So I like to serve others. I like to help others. I like to coach others. I've done it my whole career in every business I've ever had. In every situation, those nonprofit situations, I'm always, you know, either on the board or chairman of the board or something like that you know, giving everything I've ever learned, you know, to those organizations. So it's just what I like to do. So that that's my golf. You won't find me on the golf course, you know, every day, you won't find me out doing all these things. You'll find me in my spare time giving back. That's my golf. That's what I love to do. That's my hobby. So I take care of business during the day. And then I use what I've been blessed with to help and bless others. So, you know, where much is given, much is going to be required. I take that very seriously. Now that's me. That's how I'm wired. So you got to understand how you're wired. For some people, it might just be giving money. You know, you may not be gifted in giving of yourself and serving and doing that. You might be more gifted at, you know, generating income and then just giving money. You know, I do both. I contribute, you know, to charities as well as giving my time. And, you know, uh, there's a lot of satisfaction in giving and helping others and doing things. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it, you know, a lot of people say, oh, it's, you know, most people do stuff for selfish reasons, whatever. If it makes you feel good, that's nothing wrong with that. You're still helping other people, right? And, and you, you know, you, you get a lot of fulfillment out of that. But I just, that's just the way I'm wired, man. I can remember as a little kid, my parents would describe me as, you know, I'm the kid that would do anything for anybody, give them the shirt off my back. And that's just, that's just how I am. I just have a heart of service. I love helping people. Um, I do a lot of different things, right? And it sounds cool, you know, to do what I do. I do commercial and residential and development and business investing and all these different things. I coach people. Um, somebody asked me the other day, you know, what I, what I enjoy the most about what I do, what is it that I like the most? And I said, you know, for me, it's building people. What I enjoy more than anything else is pouring into people, helping them discover their God-given talents, their untapped potential, help them unlock that and watch them just flourish and just reach heights they never thought they could, they could reach and become successful. That's what I love to do. Whatever that means to that individual, it could be anything. It could be health, money, whatever. I love helping people, watching people grow, building people. That's what I've done my whole career. It sounds like I've done real estate, I've done business, and I've done that. It's like I said, I've developed people, I've built people, and I've poured into people so that they could do these other things and watch them grow. And, and more importantly, put them in a position to be able to do it and let them do it. So that, that's what fills me. That's what I enjoy doing, and that's, that's why I do what I do. That's why I get out of bed in the morning. Okay, love it. And definitely, you know, e even though we are far away, and even though the audience is far away, I mean, they, they can sense that. I mean, that, that you have the passion, uh, you know, and, and you really love helping people out, you know, and, and, and it's definitely coming out of your face and, and, and the way you talk. So definitely, that's awesome. So, you know, talking about, you know, helping people and uh, talking with people, can we talk about uh, how important it is to network with other people and maybe you have some good stories to share about, you know, networking. Yeah. So you've heard the saying, your network is your net worth, right? So you yeah. are who you hang around, you know, take a look at your five closest friends. That's 
usually where you're going to be in most cases. So <clears throat> networking is huge. There's always something you can learn from other people. And when you network, though, you need to approach it. The most important thing I can tell anybody listening is always approach everything from a point of service. How can you serve others? The buzzword out there is add value. I call it service. How can you be of service to somebody else? How can you serve somebody else? How can you help somebody else? How can you benefit from somebody else? Or, or for, how can you be a benefit to somebody else? A lot of people approach networking about what can it do for me? What can networking do for me? You know, Zig Ziglar was one of the greatest teachers, motivational speakers, sales trainers ever. Yeah. And he, he had the saying, you know, if you help enough other people get what, you, get what they want, you will ultimately get what you want. Not in a manipulative way, but in a sincere way. You got to care about other people. You know, uh, if you don't care about anyone, you can't sell anyone, right? So um, you got to make sure that when you are networking and you're surrounding yourself with like minded people and people hopefully more experienced and doing things that you want to do and better than you, you always want to surround yourself with people that are going to challenge you and they're going to bring you up. I'll use a sports analogy. I love sports. You know, if you play tennis and uh, you want to be a ten better tennis player, are you going to go play people you can crush that can't even compete? Or are you going to play people better than you? Because when you play people better, they're going to make you better. So when you network, you want to network with people that are doing things that you're not doing that are where you want to be so you can learn from them <clears throat> and they'll lift you up and bring you up. But again, you want to approach it from a point of service, a point of learning. How can you be of service to somebody else? Okay. Okay. I love it. Totally makes sense, you know, because there's a lot of people now going, if, if you're watching and if you have your own business, you know, the importance of networking and just switching from, from the word, what you say, you know, adding value to the service, <coughs> that makes, that makes it completely different because it sounds, it sounds like you, you definitely want to help people and you know, don't make it just sound like literally like give value to the people, you know, like any way yeah. possible. Like, even though like we met before, like, like, even with the, with the different people, I'm, I'm just trying to see like how I can add value to those people as well, you know, like, like really like in a general like way, because, you know, if you just give, as you mentioned, you know, if you just give, you know, it will come back to you eventually, you know, anyway. So, yeah, and I'm a connector. So when I yeah. network, you know, I listen. So part of, part of what networking is all about is listening. So getting to know people, listening, finding out what they need. And then, and then being of service by helping them get what they need. And, yeah. uh, you know, and a lot of time it's just connecting people and, <clears throat> you know, providing, you know, uh, relationships and things like that. So, you know, service networking is what I call it. Yeah. Love it. So can can we get a little bit personal? And I, I just want to talk uh, about yourself and like, what, what are your five or 10 year goals now go, going forward? I mean, where do you imagine seeing yourself in five or 10 years? Uh, you know, I'm continuing on my path of doing, you know, my projects, developing, um, you know, properties, building my portfolios for the long-term legacy assets, <clears throat> you know, uh, commercial multifamily assets. Um, you know, I'm kind of, in, I'm watching the market right now, watching things. So I'm not an aggressive buyer right now. I feel like we, we're in a bubble, you know, we're, you know, the market is peaking everywhere. So I'm waiting for that next, uh, you know, that next opportunity to jump in. It's more important to predict the top than it is the bottom. So right now we're at a top, we're at a peak. So I'm kind of, you know, very selective in what I do uh, from an investment standpoint, but I am looking to build leg legacy assets over the next 10, 20 years in my career. So taking everything that I've done and earned, reinvesting in other assets that are long-term legacy assets, big, nice trophy assets that are safe, bond type assets, class A, you know, B plus class A type office and, and you know, uh, multifamily assets. And I think in the next three to five years, there'll be an opportunity to snatch some of those up. <clears throat> so that, or develop them. So that's what I'm working on. You know, personally, uh, just maintaining, you know, my health and my lifestyle and traveling more. I love to travel and, and uh, you know, uh, but, but more important than all that, I'm on a, on a mission to reach more people, to help more people and to take the 23 years of everything I've learned and all the mistakes I've made and all of the things that I've done and help others you know, achieve their goals and fast track their careers. I get a lot of young people that reach out to me. I'm in a college town and one of the top business schools in the United States is in this town, Darden School of Business. So I get a lot of young people that come to me looking for advice in terms of what they should do in their career, what their next step is. Um, so I'm kind of on a mission to reach as many people as I can, help as many people as I can. And, uh, and I'm always, you know, always looking for opportunities to serve others in that regard.
Yeah, yeah. And, and and that's what I want to help you with, you know, that's what we're doing the show for, you know, I just want to help you to, to reach me, more people because I can sense uh, how much wisdom and how much information, you know, you acquired th throughout these 23 years. I mean, and you just keep pouring, you know, more, more of that, you know, from, from your experience walking and doing the deals, you know, and, 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 and learning from all these, you know, super great people. So definitely more people, I think definitely, and people can, can, can probably tell the same, like more people would, would need to know you. And I don't know why, why, you know, more people don't know you right now, because I mean, like, you know, you know, guys, if you enjoy the video, just please like it and share it, you know, cause this is definitely one of the best probably shows that we had so far. I mean, this guy is just giving constantly, you know, and like, I don't know. Maybe maybe he wants to get something back. I don't know. Maybe maybe you know, but I don't think so. I don't think so. This is a truly like super super great person, you know, and super positive and has so much knowledge and and, and it's just unbelievable. So can you just well, tell I've done it. Like I said, uh, you know, it's my career. It's just how I'm wired. It's what I've done in all my businesses. <clears throat> you know, it's only in the last few years that I've now branched out and created a business of helping others and and being more deliberate about that. So. I'm just mm -hmm. in the beginning stages of, you know, really getting out there. I do a lot of speaking, you know, in, in different environments and, you know, been a lot of podcasts and things like that. So I'm just now getting to the point to where I feel like I have a message to share. And it's been building, you know, and it's yeah. been something that's been inside of me, but it's been more local and individual. So now it, I think I'm ready and, you know, I'm going to write some books and I'm doing more content, you know, things like that to really, really get it out there and spend the last half of my life giving back putting all this, you know, everything I've learned, you know, to use for others. So people can learn from what I've done. Yeah. And again, I started from nothing, zero. And I've started a ton of businesses and a ton of real estate deals with nothing. So that's, what's really cool. It's relatable. I'm not some big yeah. billionaire, you know, that people can't relate to. I mean, I've done a couple hundred million, you know, and, and I've had some success, but it's not like out of this world, right? It's very achievable, very attainable from a guy who has, you know, no formal education that started with nothing. So that's the message I want to get out there. If I can do it, anybody can do it. Hard work, educate yourself, and take action. You know, that, that's what it is. Yeah, simple as that. Love it. So can you just tell people how they can find you on the platforms, what platforms they're using right now, and how they can reach you? I know you have some courses as well available right now. Uh, well, I do one-on-one -on -one coaching. I don't have a formal course yet, but I think I'm going to put some together. I've had several people asking for, like, beginner uh, real estate investing courses, you know, in the different, you know, asset types, uh, especially development. There doesn't seem to be a whole lot out there on development, uh, ground up development, like books or courses. <clears throat> so I'm going to start putting some of those together here, uh, the rest of this year. But right now I do one-on-one -on -one coaching. My website's gregdickerson.com. Uh, all my information's on there. Uh, my Facebook, YouTube channel, LinkedIn, you know, where I put content out, uh, all the podcasts I've been on are on that, you know, uh, YouTube channel. So it's gregdickerson.com. Everything is there. And as I develop, you know, more, you know, books and courses and things like that, I'm going to put those up there for people. And, and uh, you know, it's, it's interesting what people tell you. You know, they just say, hey, I can't find anything on real estate development. I'm like, well, it's all here. <laughs> you know, I got to get it out of here and get it down on paper and get it into some, some video courses so people can kind of follow along. Definitely, definitely. Oh, man, this guy is super active on, on social media, you know, maybe, maybe you're thinking, oh, he's just, you know, there, but he's not super active. Like I posted, remember, on bigger, on bigger Pockets, like 15 minutes later, Greg is, is in the comments. So, you know, definitely reach out to him and, you know, like ask, ask any questions because this, this is the man that would definitely, you know, give, give more that you expect when you ask him a question. Like, uh, so, you know, from my own standpoint, I'm just super grateful that I had a chance to meet you. And now, and now we talk and kind of face to face, even though it's, it's through internet, but it's, it's super exciting yeah. because people like yourself, again, the, the little, you know, the, sorry for saying that, but you know, the little bit older generation are just freaking, those people are, great because they know what work ethic is again you know it's not about you know the just instagram posting and all that fancy stuff it's really about the work and they have the work ethic they have a different perspective on things which is still going to be applicable you know hundreds thousands of years going forward i mean the instagram facebook i don't know maybe it's going to be here around for another 100 200 like who knows but like the, the skills and the, and the assets that you have in here, the, the wisdom that you acquired before, I mean, it's, 
it's invaluable. You know, no, no, no app or something can, can change that. And you, and you have it in you. So definitely, you know, um, any, any way that I can help, you know, sharing your story, I would like to add, you know, more value or service, as you mentioned, you know, yeah. to you and, and just spread your message because I think it's, it's super great for people to, to know like what you do and, uh, the, the way you can help them, you know, even remotely or doing coaching, you know, and how you can help them to grow themselves. So, you know, so they would grow their business at the same time. Yeah, so especially overseas and internationally, you know, right yeah. now, you know, I have some people in Canada and the United States, but, <clears throat> you know, I haven't really reached, you know, anybody outside the United States much. So it's kind of cool that, you know, you're in Europe and, you know, there's people there that have the same goals, dreams, aspirations, you know, mm -hmm. in Asia, in, you know, the Middle East. I mean, people are people. Everybody wants, not everybody, but most people want to better themselves. They want to better their opportunities for their children things yeah. like that. So it's really cool in this day and age that we can do this and we can reach the world, you know, so that to me, that's exciting. And, and that's, that's what I'm really looking forward to is getting out there more uh, internationally as well and getting message out there. Yeah. Oh, I love it. I love it. So guys, please like and share this video. If you enjoyed it the same as I did, I mean, this, this was, this was a definitely a special show, you know, today. So really appreciate the time, Greg. I know, I know this is yeah. kind of a, you know, in the car interview. So as I, as I see you <laughs> planning to go My mobile office, mobile office that I love it. So, you know, yeah. I'll, I'll let you go for now. I know you're a super busy man, you know, and, and I really appreciate the time and the effort you put in today, you know, telling people actually what it takes uh, to get in a real estate space. You know, there's a lot of great details that you gave to the people. And, you know, even though myself, I'm going to probably rewatch the, the interview just to take some notes from that. So it's definitely super awesome. And thank you for everything. So guys, if you love this interview, go and check it out. Greg's uh, links down below, go and, 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 you know, talk with him about the coaching. It's definitely, definitely a great opportunity, you know, to, to be coached by, by this man here. And uh, just follow him on all the social platforms. There's a YouTube and, and Facebook, uh, you know, pages as well. So this, is, this has been a money show with Martinez and Greg Dickerson today. Uh, again, please like and subscribe to this channel. And I'll see you in the next episode, guys. Take care.